Athens is surrounded by cemeteries. All the strange stuff started happening. Uh, things started flying around the room. The ridges at, at night is a, I think, a horror movie waiting to happen. And this guy could do up to 20 lobotomies a day. You could just barely see a presence. You could tell there was something up there. She had killed herself in Wilson Hall. <laughs> Freshman students at Ohio University found out that although everything looked innocent on the outside, on the inside, this college campus harbored a history of horror. According to the British Society for Psychical Research, the 13th most haunted place on Earth is Athens, Ohio. My name is Richard Crawford. The first uh, place they want me to talk about is an incident that uh, occurs, not occurred, occurs in the village of Bantam, where State Route 125 and 222 meet, uh, east <clears throat> of uh, the Starlight Drive-In and between Amelia and Bethel. Uh, this is known as Dead Man's Curve. It's been known as that for many, many years. When the road was first built in 1831, the uh, construction of the road was uh, very poorly made in this particular spot, and it was very easy for wagons and carriages, horses carrying people, to actually slip down or roll over the hillside. Many people died there. What goes on there today is nothing new. It, it goes way back. Uh, the road was a two-lane highway until 1968 when the road was widened between Amelia and Bethel into four lanes. And at a ribbon cutting there at 222, at uh, what is today known as Dead Man's Curve, it was proclaimed the end of Dead Man's Curve. It was a straightaway there now, it was four lanes. And uh, just about a month later, an accident was there immediately in which five people were killed in two cars. And since the night of that accident, there's been a new ploy or a new, I don't know what you would call it, a new figure has uh, shown up on the scene, something known as the Faceless Hitchhiker. Right now I am at the intersection of State Route 222 and 125. This is only the second time that I have filmed from here because there's so many bad memories here. This is regarded as the most haunted site in the state of Ohio by many people. The very first time we filmed from here, it's actually on the film, right above us in the sky was a, a group of buzzards, about 10 of them circling right here at this intersection. And that was done in broad daylight. But this place, it, it gives me the creeps of more than any other place I've ever visited in this county. It just, I, I don't know how to describe it other than if you come through here at night, if you just come down State Route 125 between Amelia and Bethel, this intersection is pitch black. It's extremely dark, like any other, like no other place you'll run into. So it has been a terrible place for people. When this was regularly a, a, an intersection in the two lane highway days, there were stagecoach accidents. There were all sorts of accidents with horse and buggy. Many things happened here, and most of them were hard to explain. And then after they widened the road, they have a ribbon cutting here in 1969, proclaiming the end of Dead Man's Curve. You have straightaways on both ends, four lanes. How can you possibly have an accident here? And within a month after the ribbon cutting, there was a car accident here in which five people were killed. Very difficult accident to explain. Since that night, there have been more than 70 people killed here in automobile accidents. And I've been told by a few friends who work with law enforcement that that may not be an accurate uh, estimate. It may be more people were killed here. 
But what has been seen here many times, and I've actually seen this myself a half a dozen times, is a person always between 120 and 140 in the morning. There has been a being of some sort that looks like it's about six foot tall, weighs about 200 pounds. You can see a head, arms, legs, the shoulders. But I've been as close over on that corner over there. I was as close as six feet from it one night and still did not see a face. There have been people here who have hit it thinking they've run over it. And then the thing gets up and chases their car over on this hillside. It has been seen in a silhouette at night and throwing boulders and rocks at cars. There have been cars here that were involved in some of the accidents where people died parked on the side of the road. Many, many horrible things have gone on up here. There's a book that came out last year called Weird Ohio that has a whole page and a painting of this being or whatever you want to call it. And it has been seen here by many people, but always at 120 to 140 in the morning. We had a, a, a law enforcement automobile up here one night, pulled somebody off and there was somebody, and there was a car pulled over. Lights on in the inside and the headlights. Nobody here. Last time I gave a tour up here, close to that time of night, everybody wanted to see it at that time of night. I refused to do it. But this road was straightened out because of the accidents. The old 125 came up the hillside and curved up this way and had a horrible drop off on it, which could explain a lot of the accidents. My basic experience here at 222 and 125 is of a uh, scary nature. I've had a couple different experiences that kind of point out exactly what happens here to so many different people, many people we've talked to. My first experience was several years ago with Faceless Hitchhiker coming from the west towards the east here at 125 at about 1.30 in the morning. Um, somebody on the side of the road walking away from us. And as I slowed down, this area is a friendly area, pretty much uh, the, the neighborhoods, everybody knows everybody. So I slowed down to see if it was somebody I knew, maybe they needed a ride, maybe they broke down. But as we went past and slowed down and actually started to pull over, uh, when I look back, this person had no face, very strange. Um, complete, complete body, complete person there. Somebody would, anybody would say was a regular person walking down the side of the road. But when we looked back, there was no face. We started to pull away again. And as I looked back in my rearview mirror, mirror again, there was nobody there. So that was one of my experiences. Uh, the first time I saw it was uh, about Christmas time, 1969. Uh, I was with a group of friends and something came running out of the woods. A, a friend of mine, uh, had to make a sudden emergency stop out there in the woods and came running out claiming there was a bear chasing him. And we started laughing and said, there's no bear in Claremont County. And he said, well, there's something on two feet. And uh, we all turned around and looked and here was something coming. We could see it under the street lights there. And it got to within, uh, I don't know, 20 feet of us or so. And we never did ever see a face on the thing. I had a friend of mine, uh, oh, I guess it was maybe uh, 10, 15 years ago. She was a nurse at uh, Children's Hospital downtown. She never wanted to go through that intersection at that time of night. And uh, she, because it was Christmas Eve, our New Year's Eve night, she decided that she would stay. They were shorthanded. She comes home and there was a detour on uh, one of the roads she normally would take. And uh, she went up to the accidents or up to the intersection in a station wagon. She was going through a divorce at the time and uh, she had borrowed her parents' car. And something stepped out, or this face of hitchhiker stepped out on the road in front of her. Uh, she uh, was scared to death. She had gotten up to the stoplight and she decided to gun it and hopefully this thing would jump out of the way. She ends up hitting the thing and goes over it with a front and back set of tires. And as she made the turn onto 222, she was horrified, realizing she might have killed someone herself. So she decided she was going to check and see. And as she's putting uh, her uh, backup lights on, she's approaching uh, this where she had hit this thing, this figure, this being, and it had gotten up already and was um, 
just within a few feet of her car, it's putting its leg up as if it was going to put its foot up on the back of the bumper and reaching up to the luggage rack to pull itself up on the car. I've, I've known some, uh, it seems, there have been guys involved, but it seems like there's ladies involved a lot. There was girls one night that talked about playing with a, a car there that uh, they had thought someone had set there just to try to scare them, and they uh, beat on the car uh, roof and uh, hit the windows and sat in the car and blew the horn. And uh, they had actually shot a couple, couple Polaroid pictures of this car sitting there. And uh, I had seen the uh, pictures of the uh, car and uh, uh, and the uh, the license plate, and uh, it was the same license plate of, of, of one of the cars that had been up there in a, in a previous accident. Uh, people have seen just one person standing up at the intersection at night. Uh, there have been, it seems like every time I went up there on tours or talks or something, we always ran into an ambulance sitting up there. Uh, there was uh, incidences where there was actually a hearse sitting there. Fire trucks, police cars. One night I was up there in 1974 and was followed. We were followed home. We had a car full of people followed from that intersection by a hearse into a friend's driveway. We ran into the house and locked the doors and peeked out through the curtains. And this hearse sat there in this driveway until it, it got, it started following us about 120. And it stayed there for about five minutes after we'd gotten there, uh, it was 140. And the car uh, turned its lights on and turned the ignition on, backed out and went up the street. And there was lights in the building across the street that shone in this, in the hearse, and there wasn't anybody in it, not at least anybody we could see. Um, just countless, countless things have gone on up at this intersection. And uh, it's usually from 120 to 140 in the morning, and as the years pass, it happens less and less. Um, I, this is just a wild estimate. I have no way of knowing for sure, but uh, I would figure probably one out of every 25 or 30 times does anything ever happen up there at all? But it's just the mystery of the place. It's extremely dark. Uh, I had some friends, Shawnee Indians, who uh, went up there with me in 1991. I was telling them about the intersection. They were in uh, the county for an event called Grassy Run, which uh, represents the largest historical society in our county. And uh, we have a huge event there at the last weekend in April up near the battlefield uh, in Williamsburg. And uh, some of them went up there and said it was a very eerie place. And they sensed there was someone there who had uh, been killed suddenly and did not realize they were dead. They figured that may be who it is. But they did say that intersection covers a Shawnee Cemetery. It's violating a historic site. Now, perhaps they, that may have something to do explaining what it is going on up there. I have no idea. But we also hired a clairvoyant back in 1971 when I was in college. She was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She went up there and talked about the place and thought it was the most evil, sinister place she had ever seen. And she said there was someone up there that wasn't happy with the situation that, that this person had passed away and was not aware he was dead. Or at least that's what she said. So... Uh, there's, but like I said, I, uh, there's many, many things that's gone on up there. And I have not been up there by, uh, voluntarily since uh, August of, or September of 1995 at that time of night. I'll go through there in the dark, I'll go through there in the daytime, but not at that time of night. Too many things that happen to too many people. It's the combination of things here in Athens. You have strange things, ghosts, a poltergeist activity. The room with the 666. Wait a minute, let me figure this out. Yeah, spooky cemetery. You throw in a crying angel, uh, a haunted mental health center, uh, residence halls that uh, have ghostly inhabitants walking the halls at night, and you end up with a pretty, pretty spooky but pretty special place. <laughs> I can't name one person I know on, on campus, and I've know quite a few people that haven't had some experience or know someone that's had an experience. People started telling me, oh, you live in the haunted room in Wilson Hall. Lights, 
curling irons, radios, all would go on and off on their own. You can hear what sounds like marbles going across the ceiling. All the strange stuff started happening. Uh, things started flying around the room. You couldn't really even make out her face, but you could see through her. Sometimes we'd hear rattling inside. There was a distinct sound of somebody or something moving things around in the room that we had just come out of. I decided not to stay in my room anymore. I stayed with friends. I've met a couple people that have felt very uncomfortable here from the start and said that they will never ever set foot in Athens, Ohio again. You'll be surprised how many people call you and say, oh, you won't believe what's going on in our hall right now. This spook file is a collection of newspaper and eyewitness accounts of unexplained events in Athens. The spook file is the most heavily used item in our department. Yes, there are all kinds of unusual events and unexplained events that may be paranormal. And there are certainly a lot of unexplained events that uh, never end up with any resolution. Documents in the spook file reveal a disturbing link between five local cemeteries and the town of Athens. When these five cemeteries are connected, they form a pentagram around the city of Athens with the center of this being at the very center of campus. As you branch out, you begin to hit residence halls and other, the, the ridges, the mental health center, and you hit areas that, uh, that are just chock full, really, of, of ghost stories and of legends behind them. There are several reasons why there's so much stuff going on here and I'm going to explain a few of them. I decided to take people out into where it actually happens. Sometimes we see some stuff that we really just can't, can't explain away. In 1873, the Athens Lunatic Asylum opened its doors. The Ridges at Night is a, I think, a horror movie waiting to happen. Part of me is really excited to go into the Ridges because it's an opportunity that not a lot of people have. Um, to be able to get in there and explore and see what we can find. And there's so many legends. Originally, when it opened its doors, uh, it was a big sign over the wrought iron facade was the Lunatic Asylum. Now, of course, it has this new name, The Ridges, to help describe, perhaps, its geographic look, a structure of 18 million bricks. And there on the top of this hill are these Victorian, uh, beautiful but very spooky, very unsettling buildings. When you imagine what a 19th century mental hospital would have looked like, this is it. There are some of the rooms you can look through and still see shackles on the wall where the inmates were, were shackled. With all the topic, I mean, when you're touching upon <clears throat> the paranormal or the supernatural, there's all sorts of opinions on this. Uh, is it for real? Uh, is it's uh, anti-Christian? Uh, it's getting too close to devil worshiping. There's great pros and cons. So much on the on these topics, and I've been asked by many people how deep I am into this, and uh, I just tell people I'm a historian and a researcher and an author. And I, I find it fun, but I wouldn't do any of these if there wasn't a lot of great history involved with them. And one of the most important historic sites in our county is the old Promont Mansion in Milford. And uh, Promont is a beautifully elegant old home. It might have been the premier house in the county at the time it was built. It took three years to build this home, 1865 to 1867. And uh, the house uh, has been the site of, and again, this is all controversy. Some of the people uh, would swear by the stories. Other people say it's a bunch of hooey, but uh, a suicide in there, uh, mysterious deaths, noises, sounds. But uh, Promont, in my experiences, has been very, very entertaining. I love going there for the history of it. It was the home for uh, many years of John M. Pattison, the only Claremont County and elected governor of Ohio. He was born in September 1847 in Owensville and died in Promont uh, just near his 59th birthday in the uh, spring of 196, 19, yes, 1906. 
It's believed that he had Bright's disease, which is a disease of the uh, kidney. And, uh, but it's also believed that the, it was uh, stepped up or hurried along when he, get, he, when he was elected governor of Ohio, he gave his speech in a very cold, uh, snowy weather, and they think that might have had something to do with it. Uh, governor Patterson uh, foresaw his death in some ways. Uh, after he'd been, he wasn't in office very long, uh, and he uh, asked his uh, wife to uh, bring, him, bring him home. Well, they took him to Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, and he just continually got worse, and he said he felt the end was near. So they brought him to Promont, and he died there in Promont. The bed he died in uh, was removed from the house, to, oh, I guess, well, many years after he died. And it was taken to a house in Batavia where things happened uh, with this bed in a house called the Hoburg House today, which is in Batavia, and that bed was dismantled and is now sitting in a garage in Batavia. No one uses the thing anymore because of the ruckus, the noises uh, with the bed. Uh, can't keep the blanket straight on it. It looked like somebody was laying there when no one else was laying there. Uh, I don't know how many hauntings there are in Promont, but I did know a gentleman who uh, was the nurse for the uh, last person who uh, lived in the house and who willed the house to uh, the Milford uh, Historical Society. It's now their museum. They do an excellent job, beautiful place. Exhibits there all the time. They're open on Fridays and Sundays in the afternoons. Um, but uh, last October, they uh, asked me to give some haunted tours of the home as a promotion. Some of them said they believed it. Some, again, did not believe it. But we did do tours. And it is known that there was a lady that committed suicide at the top of the tower, this beautiful tower. Uh, and uh, this uh, nurse for uh, the last man to uh, live there uh, absolutely would not go in the basement right? because of sounds going on in there. You heard movement but never saw anything. There have been people who've worked uh, on different projects in the basement uh, for supports for the, for the rest of the building or plumbing or what have you that will not work in there by themselves. They talk about the noises and the sounds in there and they get the creeps. But uh, I, I talked to a lady who's been the librarian there, and she and a friend of hers were working after hours one night in there, and the building's locked up, and they heard someone coming up the steps. And they told them they'd have to go home. The building was locked, and, they, and somebody kept coming up the steps, and they went to the top of the steps and heard the sounds of somebody climbing, and there wasn't anybody on the stairway. Needless to say, they went out the, uh, the back door they could go out from up there and um, were very frightened. People who have cleaned the building have reported seeing uh, like marks from, like if, if someone missed the spittoon from chewing tobacco after they had just cleaned the room. Um, just all sorts of bizarre uh, little things along that line. But the room Governor Pattison died in uh, used to overlook the old uh, racehorse track, which is a parking lot for Kroger now. And Pattison uh, liked to watch the horses train and practice and race over there. And so we know he used the room a lot. He did a lot of his paperwork, his official work up there, his personal business, and so did his wife. But uh, last year, the last night I gave a tour on a Sunday of Promo, uh, we had had things happen the other nights, people bumping into cold spots. Uh, people said, oh, it's because the house is old and it's cold. And I said, well, why is it happening in the middle of the room and not, not near a corner and no one else is feeling it? And so uh, the last tour we gave the last Halloween season, we're in Promont and um, we're in Governor Patterson's room. There's about, I don't know, 30 people in the room. We tried to take as many as we could because we had to turn lots of people away each night. And we're in the room and... Uh, I got this chill and I sort of moved forward, just uh, just chilly and everybody goes, what are you doing? I said, I don't know, I just I felt this cold spell go right down my back as if somebody was putting their hand down my shirt. And, and, and you, know, you saw people like were terrified and other people looking at you like, oh yeah, right, you know. But the uh, kicker of it all was, uh, as we're in there talking, 
several people started moving around and said, there's somebody or a cold spot going right in between all of us right over here. And so they moved out of the way and I'm looking and everybody else is looking and nobody sees anything. And then the bed very slightly gives way as if someone is laying in it. And that was enough for everybody. Everybody goes, oh, okay, well, all right, we've seen enough. And everybody <laughs> came outside the room and decided they had had enough of that segment of the tour. Okay, now you're in the basement of Building 18. Everything's connected by either the basements or tunnels, which you see the tunnel going through down at the end of it there. Oh, uh, look, at, look at this. New patients, records 1943, 1945, 46, 48. The asylum was a regular stop for a physician who conducted extreme medical procedures. He was known as Dr. Lobotomy. He would travel around the country in, in, in a station wagon and his little tools, you know, his, his ice picks. And this guy could do up to 20 lobotomies a day because it would only take 30, 40 seconds to run that ice pick through somebody's temple and spin it around a little bit and destroy their frontal lobes. And then off he'd go. were transferred all but one a woman disappeared they searched the institution three times couldn't find her anywhere the family had missed her and inquired as to where she was so they had made searches and and i guess they had made several searches you know like in two week intervals but they they never found her sometimes you'll actually look up there and you'll see the window and they see something peering down upon them uh which obviously creeps anyone out Many people report an apparition. And in this one window, you could just barely see a presence. I promise you, I know it sounds exaggerated, but you could tell there was something up there. Year after year after year of sightings of uh, the woman moving from room to room um, through the windows. Yeah. We're going to see what's going on. I thought it went over here. Oh, God. Bats are not fun. This is just a quick reminder to subscribe. You'll be notified every time we upload new and fascinating content. If you enjoy this video, hit the like button. These are an immense help to our channel. Claremont County has an incredible history. And one of the most fascinating stories in our county's history is about the village of Utopia. In my mind, Utopia and Neville are the two most historic communities of their size in the United States. Utopia's history is absolutely breathtaking and, and just incredible. Farmers lived down there in the very early 1800s. It had a spot where boats could pull in and go out. It's on the Ohio River. And it was a it was a, a shipping point of sorts uh, for years. And a gentleman by the name of Wade Loofborough, <clears throat> who was a uh, judge in the courts of Fayette County, Ohio, which is today the county seat is Washington Courthouse. <clears throat> he purchased 1,400 acres of land there for a gentleman by the name of John Otis Waddles from Connecticut. Waddles was a philosopher in his own right. He had founded a community in Michigan and Wisconsin. He had originally been in Wisconsin. His community was uh, destroyed by the local people. They did not like what they were doing. Some of his followers were murdered, executed, what have you. They tried it again in Michigan. The same thing happened. Then they came to the Washington Courthouse area. Still greatly disliked. They moved to West Liberty, Ohio, and it was there they were located when Loofboro made this purchase of land where Utopia is today. Waddle's followers came down here with them. 
he asked his followers to do three things. One, build him a home. Two, build themselves a home. And three, to make themselves a church. His home was completed. They were working on their home, which was known as a phalanx, which was an enormous building, which was going to house the entire community of 100 to 150 people. They built their home on what is today, what would today be recognized as the first plateau along the Ohio River. The French explorer Robert LaSalle talked about the three plateaus in this part of the Ohio River. So did the Lewis and Clark expedition. The second and third plateaus today are very viewable. The third plateau is under the Ohio River. The Ohio River at the time that the Fourierites and this and Waddles group arrived was probably no more than one third as wide as it is today. At no more than that, probably not nearly as wide. In the summer months, it was much more narrow. The Ohio River normally was no more than four to six feet deep. That's why it was so easy in the Indian Wars for the warriors, the Indian warriors, to wipe out whole boatloads of people coming down the river. Why it was not that difficult for slaves to cross the river. Or we have, there have been known accounts of slaves walking and swimming across the river. So, but this village was there, this home was built there on the first plateau. Waddles told his people if they got his home built and their own home built and got the church done, he would give them a big break on uh, prices for the acreage of the land and all that. His people, too, uh, may have followed some of Fourier's ideas since some of the Fourierites were still there. But the main difference between the uh, Waddles group and the Fourierites was in their religious background. The, four, the uh, spiritualists is what this was called, Waddles group, are not much different than many people are today. They did not trust religious leaders. They did not trust politicians. Subsequently, what they did is they turned to their leader, John Waddles, who was a medium and had seances to talk to founding fathers they trusted, like Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, or talk to some of their ancestors who had gone on, who they trusted, asking advice on should they plant something different? Should they have another child? Should they move? How much land should they farm? All sorts of things like that. Well, regardless, uh, this group built themselves a church, 22 feet high, 44 feet long, and 18 feet wide. The building is still standing today. It is in Utopia. People drive by it all the time. If we hadn't had an Ohio bicentennial marker put up there in uh, 18, I'm sorry, in 2003, uh, people might not even know where the building was, but it talks about it. Uh, I had this uh, marker put up. I did the uh, historical research on it, and uh, our then state representative, Jean Schmidt, uh, uh, allocated the money to us from her own personal funds to put this marker up to remember Utopia. This is the eastern entrance to the underground building in Utopia. The ladder, there is a ladder here that is the only way to get down into there. It's a 25 foot ladder. It comes from here and goes down to a packed earth floor. The walls are all carved rock, including the curved ceiling, which is a carved ceiling. It's absolutely beautiful in there. It's like an underground gymnasium. And this is where the spiritualists met <clears throat> the same year that they built this building in 1847. It's built underground to protect these people and their religious services because they were very different holding seances as part as a main part of the religious service they didn't trust people who were politicians or religious leaders they felt it with their medium john otis waddles that they could contact the dead that they trusted and he would speak to them and give them advice on questions they asked about maybe taxes having more children should they move just just any kind of question and they would talk to deceased relatives or other people they trusted such as the founding fathers you can see where there were four fireplaces in there at one time. The eastern entrance to the building has an arch over the top of it where the, that's open, where the sun will come through in the morning and give you a rainbow kind of effect on the western wall. Uh, it stays 56 degrees in there most of the year. It is absolutely beautiful. 
go, there have been things that have occurred in there that I have not personally seen myself, but I have seen pictures shot in there of mist and orbs. And I gave a tour last year to a group of people and they used a digital camera and had faces on the walls. Very odd. The spiritualists were completely distrusted and terrified anybody who knew them. So Waddles had this church built underground to protect himself and his people. They picked a good site. He wanted to be near a major city like Cincinnati. He wanted to be on the river where there was good shipping for imports and exports. That was met. But these people hurriedly built their home out of wood and stone, wood and stone, on the first plateau. They were having a housewarming party on the night of Friday the 13th, December of 1847, when they heard a rumbling outside. Some of the people believed it was, a, it was a, um, an earthquake. Some went outside and saw a, it's been estimated anywhere from a 10 to 15 foot wall of water. A flash flood hit them and the building and killed all but six people in this uh, building. Waddles himself and his brother were not in the building at the time. After this tragedy, they ended up moving to the state of Kansas and became associates with John Brown in on his plans to make Kansas a free state and also on his raid on Harper's Ferry. They were not with him on the raid, but they assisted him and helped him on these things. But anyway, Utopia sits there. Waddle's house is still there. There are stories today of six people walking up from the old path that Waddles had built from his um, phalanx or his home for his people to his home. It is known that he held special services in the upstairs, one of the upstairs rooms in his house uh, for people who had the money for a one-on-one -on -one kind of consultation or seance. And this house, no one has lived there. The current family's made it, but before that time, no one had lived there more than seven years at one time because of the visitations in this house of six people coming into this house in wet clothes. The woman's always in a blue hat and a blue dress. There's an elderly gentleman with uh, black suspenders, black pants, and a white shirt, an athletic-looking teenage boy, and three children. I filmed many television shows from there. We filmed a show there, one of the last shows we filmed there, a young lady, she was only four years old at the time we did the filming, came outside and was talking about how she wanted to be on the television show. And uh, her mother said, sweetheart, you know, you, you can't do that. And, and the, the people who were doing the filming didn't want the little girl involved. And she kept crying. And, and finally, her mother got her to keep quiet. And uh, when we were done with the filming, uh, the mother said, sweetheart, if you want to say something, go ahead. And uh, they said, well, let's just film her. Let's, let's just have the camera on her. And the little girl proceeded to talk about something that had happened the week before. She uh, asked her mother, she said, Mommy, do you remember the other night when you were doing the laundry and the dishes, you asked me to just watch TV and keep quiet and, and not bother you while you did your work. And you promised that I would get a treat after dinner. And she said, that's right, sweetheart, I did that. And she goes, I know you did, Mommy. But I wanted to tell you what a good girl I was. And her mother said, what do you mean? She said, well, I didn't let those people in the house. And she said, what people, sweetheart? She said, while you were doing the laundry and, and cooking dinner, there were six people came up on the, to the door. And they didn't knock. They were just trying to open up the handle. And I kept the door locked and wouldn't let them in. And they were looking at me and looked like they were trying to say something. I heard sounds but couldn't hear any words. And I saw them pointing at the lock and she said mommy I almost let them in but when I looked at them their clothes were all wet they had made the porch all wet and the woman in the blue dress and the blue hat and her dad scared me they just looked funny and I didn't want to let any of the six of them in so I didn't and so we heard that story. I gave a tour there one night, a woman who uh, happens to be a friend of mine, uh, most of the people decided they wanted to walk down the trail. And she and myself and a few other people stayed up by the Waddle's house. And she bent over a double and said, oh my God, somebody's punched me. And everybody ran over to her and they're looking and everybody said, well, who, there wasn't anybody nearby. She goes, I didn't see them. I don't know what's going on. 
and she is um, doubled over and, and having uh, some breathing problems and her husband comes back and he uh, looks at her and she pulls her uh, blouse up a little bit and you can see a mark where she said she'd been hit and uh, her husband gives her a hug and he says, what have you been doing? She goes, nothing, I've just been standing here. He said, your blouse is sopping wet. How did you get it so wet? Nobody knew about that either. I gave a tour one night to a group of six linemen from the University of Dayton football team there to that building. They couldn't wait to get out of there. They kept bumping into cold spots, cold spots supposedly representing dead people moving around. We've had people talk about cold spots down on the trail happening down there. Uh, a friend of mine, an excellent clairvoyant by the name of Eddie Fox, uh, there's a picture shot of him leading tours. I, I don't go down there all that often on, on the path. There are orbs and mist and fog all over the place around him. Uh, and he's been excellent. He pointed out uh, a couple of where people were standing in a house up in Milford one time, the old Lemming house. And people with digital cameras shot the pictures. And sure enough, there's orbs in the same number that he said that they, there was one at one spot, two at another. And there was that number of orbs showed up on the film. So there are a lot of things about the Waddles house. I've interviewed people that lived in that house as far back as 1917. And they have all told the same stories. And they weren't related or knew anybody that had lived there after that. So um, there must be something to that. I'm not quite for sure. But uh, the Waddles House, I regard as one of the three most haunted houses in Claremont County. Outside of Felicity, on the east side of town, is a cemetery on Smyrna Road. The cemetery, of course, picked up the name Smyrna. But the street and the cemetery itself picked up a name from a Pres Presbyterian church, which was founded out there in the early 1800s. The first minister in this church was a relative of the Reverend John Rankin, who is widely known as the leading anti-slavery person, or I should say abolitionist, in this part of the country, Brown, Claremont, Adams uh, counties, and part of Hamilton. Uh, the church was founded and out on Smyrna on the site of an old Indian village. In the 1780s and early 1790s, there was a, not an enormous Indian village. The Indian villages in our county were never permanent Indian villages. I know this may be hard to believe, but the Indians found the area to be very swampy and way too humid. They preferred to live a little further north. Plus, by the 1780s, uh, the Americans were coming down the Ohio River and creating havoc for the Indians. This area, including Anderson Township and on up to Portsmouth, was known as the Miami Slaughterhouse due to the thousands of people killed here on both sides during the Indian Wars. Christmas Eve night, 1787, John O'Bannon had made a survey, the first survey in, in this area at the village of Neville. The next day, he made a survey during a blizzard in the village of, where the village of Moscow sits today. Christmas Eve night, 1787, he's in the Felicity area, about where Felicity High School sits today. I don't know what kind of, if they were having a celebration, a party, a, a prayer service, I don't know, but the surveying party was there. There was anywhere from about 14 to 16 men in this surveying party. And they were attacked that night by a group of Indians, some estimates as many as 40 Indian braves. Uh, there was no one killed. There were several people wounded, and one gentleman was taken prisoner by the Shawnee. The man captured was a gentleman by the name of Peter Hastings. Peter Hastings was brought back to the village at Smyrna, where the cemetery is today, stripped naked and painted completely black, which made him a Katahotha or condemned one, which means he was in to be executed. Don't know all the background details, but uh, for some reason or other, he and Sweet Lips took a liking to each other. She allowed him to escape. But he said he would be back someday if he could have some of the land. She went into this idea. She allowed him to escape. Nothing was heard of Peter Hastings until September of 1795. <clears throat> Peter Hastings shows up at Smyrna Village. And the people are, uh, which is what the Indians call themselves, the people. Um, he shows up. And they're, and they're going, what is this white man doing here? And he said, well, your leader promised me land here if I would come back. And since you all have signed this treaty, 
I figure now is a good time to come back. Well, they weren't happy about this treaty in the first place, not in the least bit. And here they already were being forced to move, and here comes this American, this white guy showing up telling them he had been promised land by their leader. Well, they threatened his life, chase him off down the Bullskin Trail, which is today State Route 133 through Claremont County. And here is Sweet Lips, and they confront her and said, what, uh, what's going on here? Uh, this uh, Sheminise, or white man, shows up and says that uh, he's due some land here. And she said, well, I did tell him that he, I promised him so he would return sometime. And the, and the men, the warriors said, you never said a word to us about it. Not a word. And so they said, we are going, you know, they decided that they were going to execute her which is what they did. There's two stories how she was executed. One, she was burned at the stake in the middle of the village. And the other is that she had to dig her own grave and was praying over it and had her skull split open by the, bra by the graveside, fell in the grave, and they filled it up. Either way, she was known to have been buried there, at least according to these legends. Nobody knew where she was buried. Enter the Presbyterians. They start a church there in the early 1800s. It wasn't long after the church was there, they started making burials there next to the, next to the church. And they proceed to uh, have their Wednesday night meetings, their Sunday night meetings. And after a very short while, people quit going to church on Wednesday and Sunday nights. And uh, the rumor got out that there was a woman seen in the cemetery at night in a mystical or fog kind of form that scared everybody. And she ended up uh, being the reason that not many years later, the church actually moved into the village of Felicity where it is today. The burials continue to take place out there. There were stories that I heard for years. I went down there many times and never saw a thing. The uh, guesstimate was that uh, Sweet Lips was buried where today there is a gravestone that glows at night sometimes, not every night. It has to be a very dark night, no light in the sky whatsoever. This gravestone is believed to mark the site of the burial of Sweet Lips, the Shawnee Indian uh, leader who was executed on this site by her own people about 1795. Uh, Sweet Lips had betrayed her people by falling in love with a white man promising him land where their village was here at the Smyrna Cemetery. And there's two stories. One, she was burned at the stake by her people. The other, she dug a hole right here, was praying over it, and then had her skull split open. She fell into the hole and was buried here. <coughs> And this gravestone is uh, someone else buried here years later. But the stone, the stories of it being brighter than any other stone in the cemetery at night, I've seen it myself. We've seen it tonight. Uh, it, the legend says this is where Sweet Lips is buried. And when I say glows, I'm just saying it's a little bit brighter. It's very obvious. I have seen it myself now many times. First time I saw it was on a tour about eight years ago. I was giving a, a, one of my haunted tours. Went down the road. It's a dead end road, pardon the expression. But uh, we turned around uh, down at the end of the road and came back up. And uh, the fellow sitting next to me grabbed my arm and says, look out, look out. And I thought there was a deer crossing the road. This, is a, this road is not two lanes wide, very narrow. So I slammed on the brakes and I said, what's going on? They said, uh, look over in the cemetery. And I looked over there, and this gravestone was glowing noticeably brighter than any other gravestone in the cemetery. And they said, is this the first time you've seen this? And I said, absolutely. I was completely, I had heard the stories. I was completely unaware of it ever actually occurring. Since that night, as I said, I've seen many times things going on there. I have become friends and made acquaintances with people who live on the street who have talked about uh, at night, sometimes there are a, a mist or a fog will come over the, under the garage door or come into the, not, it, it seems like it never comes in the front door, but there will be things that uh, a mist or something will be coming from the back of the house and come around and go through a living room and people are up watching late night TV. 
Uh, I talked to a gentleman who died just two years ago who was in his 90s that told me stories of all sorts of things that used to happen in his home when they lived in a farmhouse out there. And I've interviewed many people who have had things happen out there. This is an area that's very sacred. It's a cemetery. I'm not encouraging anybody to go into there. Driving by there is bad enough as itself. As I said, it's barely bigger than one lane in the dead end road. But if you ever go down there, I, you know, it is a very, you need it on a very dark night to notice. We have sensed, uh, people have sensed, I've said, oh, that light from the house next door is focused on the cemetery. And I said, absolutely, but why aren't all the gravestones that kind of brightness? People, and then other, uh, another theory came up that said, well, the gravestone's made out of a different kind of, of, uh, of rock. Well, we sent scrapings from that and rocks all around it off of other gravestones. And the uh, University of Cincinnati uh, Geological Department said it's all the same kind of stone. There should be no reason for the difference. But today, it still happens. I've seen it myself this year. Uh, a couple of the tours I've given there this year already, you can actually see a gravestone there that glows. Maybe I shouldn't use the word glow, but it's a little bit brighter than any other of the gravestones in the cemetery. When the missing woman's body was eventually found, it had left a bizarre imprint. Has she come over? Possibly to look out the window, maybe to see somebody to yell for help. But she took her clothes off and folded them real neatly and stacked them in the window. And then she laid down here. You could see everything. You could see where she laid down. It just feels, it feels like I got chills when I walked in here. In 1981, a student who touched the stain claimed the dead woman's spirit followed her back to her dorm room. One night she was asleep. She opened her eyes and saw a face floating level with her head. It was a woman's face. This, of course, this of course freaked her out greatly, really frightened her. No one heard anything for uh, three or four days. They went in to check on, on the student to see, to see what was wrong. She had killed herself in Wilson Hall. Urban legends. Many, many urban legends. There's been a movie made about urban legends. But we have some urban legends of our own. And one of our best and one of my favorite urban legends pertains to what used to be a very narrow, secluded road in Pierce Township, or Ohio Township, near New Richmond. The road is Pond Run Road. I heard stories about Pond Run Road when I was pretty young. Uh, I wasn't even in junior high school yet, and I heard about murders happening up on Pond Run Road. And these stories just sort of tie in with everything else, but there are some things that I'll mention here uh, later on that uh, indicate to me there may be something about this story that may have some facts to it. Uh, Pond Run Road in New Richmond, uh, its first claim to fame uh, it was a large farm at one time, and a gentleman was born there in the mid-1800s by the name of John Hauserman. John Hauserman, uh, after the Spanish-American War, 1898, became known as the Gold King of the Philippines. He made great investments there and became a millionaire because of the work he did there. Very compassionate gentleman. He was very philanthropic. His money, he always uh, made sure the people in the village of New Richmond after floods were taken care of. He made sure the school children were not starving. He did an awful lot of very noble things with that money. He was found, now this is just, I've never been able to confirm this, but the, uh, the legend says that Mr. Hauserman died in his home of fright, that he was staring out in the fields behind his house one night, and when he was found, he was staring out in the fields there, having died of fright. 
There is a story that in the uh, late 1950s, there was a family that lived up on the top of the hill as you get to the where the road makes its first uh, right-hand turn, a sharp 90-degree turn. And there was a, doctor's, a doctor and his wife had a son. And this is the days before uh, people knew what dyslexia was or bipolarism or anything else. But this kid was uh, noted as being very odd and in violent at times. And the family kept him close to home. And uh, in an electrical storm one night, the uh, house caught on fire. The mother and father were asleep, succumbed to the smoke. To the smoke. And the boy who was locked in a room uh, was actually uh, not able to get out until he dislodged himself from the room and lost a hand and part of an arm. I think most of the stories go he just lost a hand uh, to get out, which made him even more frantic and insane. Not too long after that, there began to happen some odd things there. There were homes along the high, along the road, down, uh, down right next to the road. None of those homes are there anymore. These people that lived there at the times reported uh, their dogs barking late at night, snapping and growling at something. Uh, there would be food stolen that was stored out in a, uh, in a garage or other areas. Uh, different uh, canvases or tents or things would be taken. And so the stories started early about something odd going on there. Well, the road being as far out of nourishment as it was and having been a dead-end road at one time and very narrow and secluded, trees overhanging, uh, it just was a perfect setting for a great place for young people to park. And it became a parking spot. Now, when I was in uh, high school and college, uh, we would drive up there and we'd see people. We'd always look and try to find somebody and tease them or make fun of them. And it was at this time we, uh, that uh, stories began to really spread. But it was in the earlier years, there were supposed to have been teenagers killed on this road. People who were poked to death, like with an ice pick or some very sharply pointed object. And this spread into a story about a hook. And then you have this classic tale of the hook man, where uh, a couple is uh, dating up there one night and uh, they hear noises outside the car and became frightened. And uh, they had their doors locked and the steam was built up in the windows and they panicked and uh, drove off suddenly. Then when they get to this girl's home, the boy gets out of the car, this is really old days, and goes to her door, opens up the door, and as he's approaching the door, he starts to put his hand on the door handle and there's a hook stuck in the door handle. People today that live along here deny anything ever happened, and I would do the same thing. I have to agree with that. But one of the things they can't explain to me is where are all the houses that used to be along this road down here at the bottoms of the hillsides? Right where I'm standing right now, there used to be a little frame house. People moved out of it suddenly. Are they afraid of something? No one claims they were. But regardless, people moved out of here very, very quickly in the mid to late 1960s. Whether you believe the stories of, this, of the hook man or not, this bridge is where some people were supposedly murdered. It was a wooden bridge at the time. And right around the corner used to be a parking spot. This road was so secluded and narrow in the 50s and 60s. It was a very safe haven for kids to park and things went on. And there is evidence that people have lived in these woods at times. Who lived here? I can't tell you. But there is evidence that there were people here. I've been down on this road before and 
and stopped here on the bridge talking to people about the history of this area and you can hear something coming up on run on two feet not a deer not any not a horse not uh, elk or a moose or what have you but something on two feet and you can hear them as they splash in the in the shallow water there are stories of blood stains on the uh, railings that were over here uh, and on that when uh, blood stains that were absorbed into the wood on the old bridge and then around the corner were some other uh, uh, murders were uh, supposed to have occurred. There are other stories such as uh, one night there was noises outside a car again and this uh, boy was a big athletic kid who wanted to show his prowess or his courage and decided he was going to finally end all these rumors about whatever this vicious thing was going on. He got out of the car but before he got out he told his girlfriend to lock the doors, roll up the windows and wait until he knocked on the door to let him in. Well, he must have been gone for quite a while. She fell asleep, but she did hear knocking on the door. And as she opened up her eyes, she looked straight ahead. And to her shock, it was daylight. She had been, she had fallen asleep for a long time. And there was a police officer that was knocking on the door. And she opens up the door and he says, uh, young lady, uh, we are here to, to get you. Uh, would you please come with us to the uh, police car? And she said, where's my boyfriend? And they said, uh, well, just, just come to the police car. Come straight to the car. We'll take you home. Uh, just don't look around. Just come straight to the police car. And she begins to make an approach to the police car. Take, gets about halfway there and decides uh, to look back around. Uh, there was a story that she said she'd forgotten her purse. She turns around and looks, and her boyfriend was dead up on top of the car. And there was blood coming down the back window in the back side windows that was not in the front windows where she was sitting. So these stories persisted. There are worse stories, and there still are stories of, of anywhere from six to eight people having been killed up there, everyone a teenager. Uh, I have been on the road many times. Uh, the old bridge, which was wooden, is now paved over, was where some of the murders were supposed to have happened. And then there is another pull-off spot that's still a large area, but now there's a driveway going through it to a house. And uh, one night I was going down there with my best friend uh, during college, and uh, <laughs> amazingly, I mean, the chances of it are incredible. Our car stalled on that bridge. I was never so scared in my life. We got out and we actually heard something running down Pond Run, the creek there. Uh, and we became extremely frightened, but got the car started. It could have been a deer. It could have been uh, anything. Uh, but of course, that story, you know, just added uh, more fuel to the fire. Now, I gave a, ha a tour of the hauntings in that part of the county uh, just last Thursday night. And uh, as we're approaching our spot where we're going to go to the end of Pond Run Road, where it comes out to Merwin 10 Mile Road, <laughs> a, a Pierce Township police car was blocking the last section of the road. And an officer was standing there. The lights were on in the car. And the uh, the lights were blinking on top of the car and we couldn't get around. We had to find another way to get around, which just added more to it. But even today, if you come down US 52 and you get to Pond Run Road, where it crosses old US 52, there is a street lamp there. That is an old, the only light you can see. And as you look up the hill to Pond Run, it looks like a black hole in space or something. Very, very spooky. In fact, in the book, I, the most recent book I wrote about uh, the haunted history of Claremont County, Ohio, uh, we shot a picture that's in the book, and it is as eerie as possible. Uh, it's just, it's hard to describe. You'd have to see it for yourself. People there today understandably say it's all hogwash. You know, people, you know, it's nothing ever happened there. There's nobody that lives there. I know that's lived there that many years and uh, but the amazing thing is these people claim that but not one of the houses that used to be on the roadside on, on the immediate roadside are there anymore they're all gone the houses that are built there now are these enormous castle or a mansion looking like homes 
on the hillsides overlooking the sights and the sides of the road where this hook man of Han Run Road was supposed to be seen. The lights on these houses are not your normal size lights. They don't light up the driveway particularly. They don't light up the sidewalks. They don't light up the house a whole lot. Most of these lights are enormous lights looking like search lights. And most of them are, fo are focused in the side yards or in the woods behind the house. So if nothing's going on there, I'm still having questions on why this kind of mystery still persists to this day where something that wasn't supposed to happen, if things aren't still going on, these people have some reason or other to believe it and are doing their best to make a check on whatever is, is not supposed to be happening on Pond Run Road. In 1981, a resident committed suicide after claiming to be haunted by a woman who died in the Athens Lunatic Asylum. A student on the fourth floor committed suicide and under strange circumstances. And ever since then, it has really held the reputation as the most haunted place on campus. Just do me a favor and everybody just sort of crouch down and, and uh, get a good hold of this grass, feel the ground. The ground you're feeling right now is Indian burial ground, sacred ground to Native Americans. So this has been a uh, holy grave site for centuries. Um, if you guys are ready, we'll go ahead and uh, start heading into Wilson and see what we can come up with, see what we can find. You guys set? All right. Most people never get the chance to see what you guys are about to see. What we're going to do is, again, we're right here at, at the gateway to Wilson. Uh, the most haunted room on campus is just four flights of stairs straight up. All right, let's head on up. Like I said, four flights right up here. Is, We've had several students with a lot of what I've heard referred to as like a psychic slap in the face, where you walk into a place and you're hit by something that makes your hair stand on the edge and puts you in a really uneasy, uneasy state. It's, it is, it is, you're absolutely right. Right here through this door is, uh, is pretty much right where it happens. This is the hallway where uh, most of the ghost activity is centered. You guys ready? Yeah. I said we've looked out, I've got the key. Uh, I got the key from the university to, to open the, the door here. Uh, come on up here and I'll show you guys something on the door and then we'll, we'll fill you in on the story a little bit more. This is the door where people say that sometimes you can see a, an outline of a demonic face take place, it's in the wood grain. Let's see if we can see it. It's a little... Yeah, right here. See the eyes? Do you see it, Amy? Do you see it? Do you see it? Horns right here. The eyes. It's right there. Right there. Here's the, here's the story. There was a student. She, uh, she was into practicing the black arts, whether it was uh, some sort of perverted witchcraft or, or demonic worship, we don't know. But very soon after she moved in, people on the floor began witnessing very strange phenomena at night they would hear chanting coming from within the room, chanting and strange, guttural, growling sounds. Books would fall off of bookshelves, uh, brushes would fly across the room, doors would slam themselves shut with no wind. Following that point, that night of terror where no one could sleep, they didn't hear from her again. Three or four days later, the RA, the resident assistant, became concerned and keyed into the room to find that she had committed suicide. But before she had done that, she had smeared symbols and words all over the walls in her own blood. After that, the university cleaned up the room and the students, uh, new students moved in the next year. But sure enough, they weren't in the room but a few days when things began to move. Doors would slam, drawers would open and shut. And right there on the wall, that red blood began to seep through coat after coat of paint. And that happened no matter how many times they painted it over. Eventually, no one would live in the room. So it was turned into a boiler room that we're gonna see. Going we're going in, okay? We're gonna go on in. Okay, come on in. Come on in. If you come right over here, you can see where the wall was taken out. That's the wall that had the blood coming through it. 
the university, the only way to stop it was to completely destroy the, uh, another door slam. The only way to do it was to completely take out the wall. It was the only way to stop that from coming through. Can we go? Oh, it's just a board. It's a board. It's a board. Okay. All right. Do you guys want to go? Do you want to get out of here? All right. Let's go. I right, agree. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's get out of here. Oh, what happened? There was a knock on the door. Like a chain oh my god! Like that. Yeah, I'm breathing so hard right now. She's right here. She's standing right here. That's some serious chills. All right. Outside. Okay. All right. Let's let's get the door open and get out of here. Uh, let's get the door open. No. <laughs> No, we need to go. We need to go out this way. We need to go out here. That was not a jingle. That was a knock. Yeah. That was a push. I didn't hear it. I was still that in the back. No, that was a. Uh, 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 uh. Was. <sighs> I can't. <laughs> I'm sweating. So. Yeah, I, my heart is my the room? my heart is racing. That's the room. Well, that's the room at the end of the hall right there. You know, you hear stories about stuff that you know this room's creepy or whatever. And you show up and it's a room, but mm, that was. It's got something to it. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share to keep fascinating content coming here at Nightmare Nexus.